Hello everybody, this is Big Anklevich back with another astounding episode of the Ankle Cast. Um, welcome back. Uh, I bet you're surprised that I'm already back. I know it's not like it's been quick, but it hasn't been a year or even six months. Um, uh, I told you I was going to come back and kind of restart this thing. And uh, so here we are. We're, we're doing this. Um, today's episode hopefully will be interesting. Uh, I... I'm including a story in today's episode. Uh, basically, here's here's the dilly-yo with uh, the ankle cast. I want to try and make it more of a thing. Um, more, uh, you know, Rich does his Rich Outcast, and he includes stories, like, all the time, and he makes me feel like I suck. Um, cause, like, I don't try, because, I mean, all I ever do is to just talk for a while in a car and then just put it straight up without even editing it even a little bit. I know that Rish edits uh, the hell out of stuff. If you've ever heard, I mean, one time there was a montage of all the ums, uhs, and so forth that he cut, he cut out of that week's episode, and it went on for, like, almost as long as the episode. It was like a five-minute montage of just um uh uh um uh um um so <laughs> it was really cool uh to hear i'm not gonna do that I and mean, for one thing it's really hard to edit anything out of uh the the car because you have so much background noise that you can tell when things have been cut it just it shows up it kind of sh- appears. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about, but I am talking about just, just put more into it. So I've got this story that we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna play for you and then we'll talk about it. I'll talk about it and I will invite you to reply. Um, but after that, uh, in upcoming episodes, I, I have an interview. I interviewed my nephew. My nephew came to town for his brother's wedding, and I thought, you know what, this is an interesting opportunity, because this is the nephew of mine who's actually listened to my show, and, and I thought it'd be interesting to talk to him just about what it's like to listen to the show when you were already familiar with Big Anklevich before you started listening. Maybe it's not interesting. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I haven't listened back to the interview yet. I've done the interview, but I haven't listened back to it. And I'm afraid it's going to be terribly dull. And then I'm going to have to edit the crap out of it because of, you know, personal things that need to be removed from it that I over-shared. Uh, stuff like that. I don't know. Um... So there's that coming, and I'm, and I'm planning on doing more stories like today's story. Uh, Justin Charles loves to edit stuff. Uh, something's effing wrong in his head. I don't know, but he likes it. And so, uh, you know, he's always chomping at the bit saying, hey, give me another story because I'm done with this one you gave me. And now it's been three months since you gave me one. Uh, so I figured since the Dune Steve is, you know, running kind of slow, I would maybe do a bunch of my stories. I have a fair amount of stories that I wrote that uh, I wouldn't share normally. I wouldn't put it on the Dune Steve as, hey, here's my story. Hope you like it. Because I don't think you will. You know what I mean? It's a story that is missing something. And so what I was thinking it would be cool to do is to share them on the ankle cast. And, you know, you can listen to it and then be like, oh, yeah, what's missing there is this. Um, and then it can be kind of like a, a conversation. What? Uh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. 
before I go any further, I'm going to toss to my story, and then we'll talk more about this kind of stuff afterwards, okay? So this story, I think, is called Bumps in the Night. I want to say it's called that. And I wrote it a while back. I don't even, you know, I only vaguely remember writing it at all. I think what I wrote it for was the October Scary Story event. Uh, we used to do this thing back when we first started the podcast. It was it was a thing that Rich was doing before we even started the podcast. He would do it with his friend Jeff, where uh, just during October, you had to write a scary story. That was just the deal. Uh, and... You know, that w- he would do that with his friend, and they would just do that every year. They'd write a story. And then his friend started not being as interested in writing as he used to be, and, and it became a thing where it was just Rish doing it. And then Rish tried to uh, branch it off to me, and I was wishy-washy. And then I think we tried to do it for the podcast, and we got some weak responses. Sometimes we got some... We got a few stories, and you could tell that the people hadn't done, you know, hadn't followed the requirements of writing the story during October, like we said, that's what you had to do. You could tell people were just like, oh, I've got a scary story here in my trunk, I'll just pull it out and send it to them. Uh, and eventually we just gave up on it. You know, we used to podcast like the, the best one or two stories from the scary story event, and uh, it got to be so poorly... The, the, the enthusiasm for it was so low that we just stopped. Um, maybe someday we'll bring it back. I don't know. Probably not. I think we've probably maybe moved on from it. But anyways, that's what this story, I think, came from. It was, you know, I think the podcast had been going maybe a year or two. And we were doing the scary story event. And I was obligated to write a scary story. And I didn't have a good idea for a scary story. And so I just kind of said, okay, let me, let me see what I can figure out. What scary story do I know? What can I think of? And I never came up with a good idea. And so then I wrote this. I don't think the idea is good. It's not interesting. It's cliche. Uh, and I don't know if it's worth telling just because it's my telling of it. Or not, you know, I, I sometimes say that, and we've said that with Broken Mirror story events, that, uh, you know, it's worth doing, you know, a, a story just because your story will be different than someone else's. It will be you that tells it, and therefore all the details, all the events, everything that happens in it will be different. You know, we talk about the movies that come out periodically where like some idea gets in vogue and you know you get a movie about an asteroid hitting the earth twice in the same summer or you get a movie about a computer animated movie about insects twice in the same summer and uh not because i mean probably one was rushing theirs out to beat the other but that's not why they did that uh, I think it's just one of those, you know, it was just, it was in vogue. Uh, so that's why they came out the same summer. I don't, I don't understand exactly how it works, why that happens. But, you know, there's ideas that are out there. I mean, like, everybody's into zombies right now. And so zombie stories are really common. And uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do your zombie story. It's because everybody else is doing it. Sometimes that means more so you should do it. Because I guess you probably have a better chance of getting it published. Because people are like, oh, zombie stories are so hot right now. And so they'll read it. Whereas otherwise they'd be like, oh gosh, zombie stories. We don't do those. Those are lame. Um, so, you know, maybe it's worth it just for that. So anyways, I'm not sure how I got off onto this tangent about writing a story. Even though it's similar. But I guess... Maybe I was saying my story was cliche or something. It, it, basically, it's about monsters and closets, which is not a new idea. It's nothing novel. It's nothing amazing. 
and I wrote it really short because, you know, I had to write a story for a scary story event, so I did, and I think I probably wrote it in a day, and when I was done with it, I was just like, you know what, I don't know, this story's not worth even having spent the day on, but at least I can say I did one for scary story event or something, um, but yeah, it went, it, it never saw its way out of the folder that I stored it in on my computer. Um, until now, when I thought, you know what, maybe I can just put this story out and uh, we'll see what people have to say about it. Because, uh, you know, I, uh, I like writing. I kind of, I mean, I want to be a writer. Um, I'm lacking motivation. And I'm lacking probably a lot of knowledge in how to do it. And so I'm going to put it out there and then you guys can tell me what you think about it. So here's the story. Let's play it now. And then I'll be back in just a minute and we'll talk about it a little bit afterwards. And uh, if there's anything I haven't already said, I'll say it. Bumps in the Night by B.D. Anklevich. Daddy! It was the fourth time this evening and the fifth night this week that Ron had needed to make the trip to his son's room to soothe him back to sleep. It was four in the morning now. How late could this go? Jeremy, Ron said sleepily, barely awake enough to stand upright. What is it now? The monster's in my closet! The panic in his little face was real. It would have been disturbing to anyone. Anyone but Ron. He'd been through this routine so many times that it had become sort of a ritual in his family. Ron missed the days when it had been his wife's responsibility. But she'd disappeared two years ago. No one had ever found a body, and Ron still doggedly held out hope that she was out there somewhere and would return one day like that Elizabeth Smart girl did, months after everyone had given up on her. Before her disappearance, Ellen had been the one to take care of Jeremy's daily outbursts of night terrors. It was so maddening. There's a monster in my closet. Or, There's a monster under my bed. Or, There's a monster outside my window. They'd already been through all three of these this evening, and now they were back to the first one again. What the hell was Ron to do? He got no sleep at night, so he sleepwalked his way through each day. His job performance was dismal, and he was on the verge of being fired. Layoffs were looming, and his name was on the top of the list of people they could do without. But he'd be lucky to make it to the layoffs alive. He nearly fell asleep on his way to work every day. Even with the window open to the freezing cold January air, the radio blasting as loud as it could, and a giant-sized coffee in the cup holder, he was nodding off every morning. Jeremy wasn't doing much better. He was tired and irritable in school, getting in fights and alienating all his friends. He couldn't stay awake to complete his schoolwork, and his grades were dismal. Ellen had finally cracked, and despite Ron's objections that his son wasn't crazy, sent Jeremy to a psychologist. Ron had continued the visits after his wife's disappearance. The doctor said that Jeremy was making progress, even if Ron was yet to see it. In your closet, is it? Ron said. Yes. Jeremy said, and pulled his blanket up over his face as Ron yanked the door open. As usual, nothing but clothes and toys in there. Hey, Jeremy, look. Jeremy didn't remove the blanket from over his head. Look, Jeremy, Ron thundered. There's nothing in here. You can go back to sleep. The blanket inched down his face until his eyes appeared. Okay? Ron asked. Okay, Jeremy said. Ron slammed the closet door shut and left his son's room. His son's new room. Ron had moved him from the other bedroom to this one in hopes that new scenery would make a difference. The monster's home had to be in the kid's old closet. Now, with a new closet and so forth, wouldn't that help? No, 
Not at all. The monster was apparently as mobile as Jeremy's head was. Ron plopped back into his bed and almost immediately drifted back to sleep. A strange gurgling sound pulled him back out of his slumber. Crap, was that Jeremy again? Six times in one night was just too much. He stomped back to the boy's bedroom and threw open the door. Jeremy wasn't in his bed. Weird. That kid huddled under his covers all night long like a rabbit in its den, worried that even one foot out on the floor would alert the predators. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom? Ron checked, but the bathroom was empty. Jeremy? he called. No answer. Jeremy! he yelled louder. Still no answer. What was going on? With growing panic, he began searching for his son. He started in his room, and although he knew that his son feared the closet and the space under the bed like mice fear owls, he looked in both places. Nothing unusual. Lights clicked on the whole house through, but Ron found no sign of him. Could it have happened again? Just like what had happened to Ellen? Terror began to creep its way into Ron's heart. He completed a circuit of the whole house. Then he put on boots and a coat to look around outside with a flashlight. Still nothing. Back inside, he went back to his son's room. Was there any place that his son could be hiding in? He looked under the bed again and back to the closet, throwing the door open wide in his panicked haste. His eyes bulged, and his jaw dropped wide open. Lurking in the small space of the closet was the most hideous creature he had ever seen. It stood erect like a man, with the bulk of a buffalo, the jaws of a crocodile, a thick pelt of rough black hair, bristling with horns, antlers, and worst of all, eyeballs, hundreds of them. The beast grinned toothily when it saw Ron standing flat-footed in the closet doorway. He could see that its hair was matted with a coating of blood. Behind the creature, where a rack of jackets and button-up shirts belonged, instead swirled a mind-bending void. Within it, Ron could see millions of other monsters, each one as impossible as the creature before him, each one different from the other. The monster in the closet opened its massive jaws, teeth glinting. Ron knew there was no chance for escape from this thing. This thing which had already taken the rest of his family. It, or some other monster like it from that hideous void, he had nothing left to live for anyway. He closed his eyes and waited for the inevitable. Okay, so there you go. Bumps in the night. I think it was called that, although gosh, I'm recording this and I don't have it in front of me and I can't even remember what I called the story. That's how I just pushed it into the folder to the back and forgot about it. Um, yeah, I think that's what it was called. Uh, I did record it myself, so I've read it recently, so I should remember the title, but I don't. Uh, anyways, yeah, so I did that story as a October Scary Story event story. And... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing awesome about it. It's a story about a kid who is always crying that there's monsters under his bed, which is just one of those things that's so time-worn that, uh, you know, I mean, there's Monsters Incorporated where they took that and turned it on its head a little bit. Uh, there's a story we did by Rish, I think, that's uh, a story where... It's like a vampire child who was saying, ah, there's people, there's, there's, there's an old English professor under my bed with a stake or whatever, you know, he's, he's seeing monsters, but they're different kind of monsters, you know, there's the, the sun is under my bed. I don't know <laughs> stuff, whatever an enemy of a vampire is, uh, you know, those kind of things make a story worth telling if you've got a twist on an old trope that's interesting and new but I didn't have that all I had was there's a kid 
that says there's monsters in his closet, and then there is monsters in his closet, the end. Um, I guess that might possibly have been a twist on that idea way back in, like, I don't know, 1940. Um, but at this point, that's so uninteresting that I don't know why I bothered to write the story, other than that I was kind of contractually obligated as a host of the Doonstief to write a story. I tried to make it somewhat engaging. I don't know that I did, though. Um, what did you guys think? Here's, here's what I would like to happen with these stories that I'm going to put out. Um, I'm going to talk about stuff, and, and then uh, at the end of each story, but I invite anyone who listens to this podcast to record a response. Listen to the story, and then formulate your thoughts, and be like, okay, here's what this story needed. Or, yeah, you know what, you were right. You should have uh, just not written it at all because it's so cliche, so overdone that who cares? There, there was no point. Other than just, you know, to practice writing, I guess, you know, there, there was no use for a story like that. Um, or whatever, whatever it is that your take is on it. Record yourself saying it and then email it to editor at doonstief.com don't put it anywhere else because I'll never see it I mean it'd be unlikely enough for me to find it there much less anywhere else so it's possible I may put another get a different email address that's just for the ankle cast but for now send it to editor at and uh you know, tell me what you think of, of this story. What it is that you had to say about it. What could I have done to have made it worthwhile, to have made it better? And, you know, with all the stories that I present on here, that's what I would like you to do. And I will use your recording on the AngleCast and talk about it and so forth. Because I know that I am not professional writer material just yet uh, you know they talk about that a lot with writing there's a lot of people that have writing uh, instruction booklets and that kind of stuff that say that you know you have to write a million words and they're all gonna be shit you know the whole first million every single one of them which I mean why would you just keep writing shit over and over and over and over and over again it's like the uh, you know the Shining, where he just writes, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, over and over again. But anyways, yeah, that's what you're going to write. Uh, and then once you get past doing that a million times, uh, the, um, the good stuff comes. Um, supposedly, but I think you have to be, you know, working toward getting better while writing shit. Or else, even once you get past a million, you're still just going to write more shit. Because you won't have learned anything if you weren't concentrating on fixing the things that you don't do well. So I'm kind of hoping that you all can tell me what it is that I don't do well. Because, um, yeah, I'd like to uh, improve that. And, you know, maybe at some point I will uh, do those things better. And then I could say, hey, I'm professional writer material. Because I have improved my craft. I am no longer writing shit over and over again. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'd like to do. And another thing that I hope to gain from it is just some motivation. I don't know what my problem is. Ever since we did that thing, which killed this podcast a year and a half ago year and a few months anyways uh, where we said we were going to write a novel over the space of a summer and then I kind of talked about it and moved toward it and then when it was time to write I froze up, I clenched up like Cameron 
started making a diamond. Um, and I was unable to do it. And then I was so embarrassed at my failure that I just wanted to disappear. And I've just, I haven't recovered from that. I have written almost nothing since that fateful day. I still have the story of The Gauntlet, which was to be my novel, uh, so far. I mean, there's so much of it planned out, so much thought out in my head that I could probably just sit down and start going on it. Not saying that that's going to be good, which is maybe one of the problems that I have. I don't want to spend all the effort of writing a novel if it's not going to be good, especially The Gauntlet, because The Gauntlet is supposed to be good. It's, it's, a, it's the first book of a series. So if it's not good, then the series will not come to pass. But it, sh it would be cool if it did. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I need motivation to get back into writing stuff because I've I've clenched I'm verklempt I can't uh, I can't make myself write anymore I, I can't do it I don't know what my problem is and Rish keeps trying to encourage me uh, or shame me or you know there was the one time where he held me down and stabbed me repeatedly in the shoulder and um, yeah I had to go for many surgeries after that I don't know if that was supposed to be encouragement for writing or not. It was just one of those things. Uh, stop beeping at me. I don't care. So, yeah, I'm hoping to gain that. And I'm hoping that your comments that you guys have for me might help me to gain that. Might make me feel like, you know what, I can go, I can do this again. I can go for it. I can try it. Um because I need to. I have so many ideas up there. You know, I, I wrote that story that we aired on the Dune Steve way back when called The Battle of the Ideas uh, about the author who had a lot of ideas in his head and he wasn't writing and the ideas decided to rebel and escape from his head because they were tired of being trapped there. And that's kind... I mean, that was a... It was a autobiographical thing. I mean, that's how... I am. I have all these ideas up in my head, but I don't write them. And someday the ideas are going to want out in any way that they can, even if it means killing me. Uh, so yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen. But I would like to start writing some of these ideas and get these things out there um, for people to experience. Uh, I've, t I've talked with Rish. I don't know if I've ever said this on the show, but I think I probably have said everything on the show at least once. Uh, but yeah, one of those things that I would love, you know, I've seen shows of like where they're interviewing the creators of Pixar, for example. And the creator of Pixar is sitting there in his office, and on the shelf in his office, he's got like every possible variation of toy that has been made from the ideas that he came up with. So it's like 60 Buzz Lightyear figures and 60 Woody dolls and 60 uh, Wallies and et cetera, et cetera, on down the line, all the things that this company has created. Man, I don't know what it is. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm a dorky toy collector, but, uh, oh, that's like my dream thing that would be the coolest thing ever would be to have a toy from something that I created. I had a friend in college that I knew. Uh, he was the other good writer in our film program. Uh, Rish has mentioned him a few times. Um, I, I think they had a little competition kind of a thing going because Rish was the good writer and then this guy was the other good writer. And this guy... Uh, moved to LA and got into writing for cartoons and he has been involved in the creation of several cartoons and several of these cartoons I have seen toys of at you know Toys R Us or wherever a kind of place that would have more obscure toys you know not the kind of things that you just get at like Walmart or whatever but 
but still there's toys of or figurines or figures or whatever you want to call them of all the uh, all these characters that he'd created and gosh that would be so cool if something that I had created be, took off in some way and I had a toy of this thing and I don't know why but I look at the gauntlet and I think this if of anything that I've got up in my head right now this is the thing that could be a toy there could be a cartoon or a comic book or a movie or a TV series based on this. And uh, it just seems like an idea that could take off like that. And so, gosh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to try and write it because I don't want to waste it. I don't want to waste it and write a crappy, oh, this guy's not really a good writer yet book about the gauntlet and then because of that, I'd never write the next gauntlet. Uh, nobody reads it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody cares. I don't know. It's just one of those stupid things. I'm sure I'll come up with other ideas down the line of other things that could be uh, something like that as well. Weird. I just changed lanes because there was a sign, one of those electronic signs telling me to change lanes like the lane was closing. There's all these construction cones and stuff everywhere. So I changed lanes and the stupid lane didn't close. So I got over for nothing. I need to be in the lane that I was in before to get off. And that was annoying. Sorry, that was a bit of an aside for you. That was just a little parenthetical into the podcaster's brain. Uh, So yeah, back to toys. I like them. And I want some of my own stuff. Uh, But yeah, I don't know. It's probably pretty far-fetched. I mean, like, somebody like Abby Hilton, she should have toys of all these fantasy things that she's created. Maybe she will someday, I don't know. Maybe, uh... Maybe that'll still get picked up. Although, it seems like she... (laughs) She makes her children's novels adult, so it's hard to get a toy out of something that's really adult. Uh, So maybe it won't happen. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, so that's kind of what I'm looking for for this Anglecast in the future is... is, I'm planning on doing a couple other stories like that. You know, Rish actually mentioned something he thought it would be funny to do on... The Dune Steef is uh, a story, uh, like taking, doing like a broken mirror kind of story where he takes all the things that we put into a broken mirror competition that didn't win, which for me is everything. But for him, he would enter, I guess, under fake names. I mean, there's stories out there that he wrote that I'm still, I'm I'm sure that I still don't know which ones they were. Like, he put it in under some fake name that I didn't know. And, uh, there's one that I know he put in. Uh, and I gave it a bad score because I didn't like it. And I think he's still bitter about that. Which I can understand because how many times have you heard me complain about the guy who gave me a one on my story? Which, I mean, come on, seriously? I mean, that's like the the score you give to a story that's, like, unreadable. Somebody else gave it a 10. You can't get a 1 and a 10 on the same story. That just doesn't work. Anyway. um, Yeah. So, uh, that's what I'm I'm, kind of hoping to get out of these stories. And so, yeah, one of that one of the stories that I wanted to share was one of the stories that I put in in the Broken Mirror um, episode or Broken Mirror contest that uh, didn't get high marks. Um, and I did some stuff with it, and I was trying to improve it and workshop it, and eventually I realized I just needed to move on. And. Uh, I can share the experiences that went along with that story and and other stories. I have several 
that I think would be good for sharing stories that I... There's a few that I thought were good at the time. And then now I go back and I read them and I'm like, I don't like this story. I don't think it's any good. Uh, and I'm, I, I can't put a finger on why it is. Like, I, was, I don't like my character anymore. She's lame. Or whatever. And so I'm going to share those those uh, stories uh, in hopes that maybe you guys can tell me what it is that's missing. Why it's not. Why it doesn't work. Uh, what should I have changed? And I can, sometimes I'll have, I'll have a guess and I'll say, I think this is what I needed to change. And other times I'll just, no damn idea. Because I'm not a very good writer and that's... Uh, something that happens to me I'm, I think Rish is one of those guys who he's just got a really strong sense of story and if something's not working he can usually put his finger right on it maybe he has a blind spot for his own stuff I don't know but I know that he can do a really good job with other people's stuff but for some reason we used to <laughs> we used to share stories back and forth with each other and give each other comments on it and that has gone away completely and I don't know why maybe it's just because I don't write stuff anymore I don't know but I, it went away before I stopped writing stuff I think um, maybe we should start doing that again I don't know but I'd have to start writing again so we'll see if I can ever get there you know I'm just rambling now so I'm going to go ahead and call this, this podcast to a close uh, I hope that you got some enjoyment out of the story and I hope that you have some idea as to what could help it. Uh, Justin Charles sent me a comment after he edited the story and said, yeah, that was a good story. Kind of fell apart at the end there, but otherwise it was good. And I, yeah. And then he, he like sent me a bunch, he always sends stickers along with his comments, which I guess is something you can do on the Facebook Messenger. And yeah, he sent me like some stickers that were kind of like sheepish ones. Like, sorry, didn't mean to say your story was shitty, but couldn't help it. Or, or whatever these stickers were trying to communicate. But anyways, yeah, if you have some comments, send them my way. And I'll, I will play them all on the, the next episode. So let's just chill until then. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklevich. Have a great day.